Mark. Um, I'm so excited about this event. I'd like to welcome to the Drama Bookshop, Tony Award winning set designer and author of the book Transforming Space Over Time, which we're all holding, Vale of Bortz, uh, who's represented on Broadway with The Piano Lesson, uh, uh, Ohio State Murders, and Old Man in the Pool. Leading our discussion today is Peabody Award winning broadcaster, Elliot Forrest. Thank you. How great is this? Uh, yes, Elliot Forrest from WQXR. I'm the afternoon host and uh, sometimes heard on WNYC as well. I wear two hats. Um, I'm also a stage director, maybe one of the most recent directors to work with Beowulf. Uh, I loved his book and I was very excited to uh, be able to uh, talk with him today about it. And of course, we have some other very special guests coming in just uh, a moment. But first, please welcome Beowulf Forrest. We're going to chat a little bit, but first, uh, did you want to yeah, read I, something? I, I, am, I am told that it's customary for an author to read, so I'm going to uh, give you guys about five minutes of the book right here. Um, this first is from uh, the chapter about Act One, which is a play I did with uh, James McClain, who is one of our upcoming guests. What constitutes a long, long time? In a show with just a few scene changes, 20 seconds may not seem very long, but if you have 50 locations and it takes 20 seconds to change the, each set, that amounts to more than 15 minutes of scene changes in the course of an evening. That can absolutely kill the pace of the play, especially one that's three and a half hours long to begin with. Okay. The concern that scene changes could weigh down the story led me toward an idea that the action could all play out continuously in an abstract space. Usually, less is more on stage, so I started working on a set representing an empty theater seen from the side perhaps with an on-stage auditorium visible. Scenes would play out with minimal furniture used flexibly. For instance, the kitchen table might become the producer's desk just because the actors treated it, treated it as such. This was hardly a new idea. I designed this sort of backstage set before, and other set designers have too. But it seemed like the right, it, but it seemed right for a story about life in the theater, and would allow me to mask the depth of the huge stage so it wouldn't overwhelm the intimate scenes. I had a nagging feeling that the idea was not grand enough for the scope of the play, but I made an appointment to show it to James and get his reaction. Within six minutes of sh showing and explaining this backstage idea, I could tell James thought it was a cliche. Stifling a yawn, he said, you got anything else? <laughs> Luckily, I did. The night before our meeting, the nagging voice in my head had told me I needed a better idea. And I had a eureka moment. An idea popped into my head, almost fully worked out. It felt like divine intervention, but I guess it was my subconscious. My only tool to encourage these epiphanies is to spend time thoroughly reading and discussing a show, and then leave it alone for a few weeks without attempting to nail the design. My subconscious seems to keep working when I'm not, occasionally with exciting results. This kind of inspiration doesn't always hit, but in this case, at zero hour, it did. I could use the Beaumont's huge size to my advantage. Rather than fighting against it, I'd make a three-story tall structure out of massive raw wooden beams, like the skeleton of a turn-of-the-century tenement. The beams would define many, many small rooms in which the story took place, all packed and stacked together around a turntable. This way, each of the locations could be fully realized. If I could work out the location of each room in the scenic structure to mirror the play's written structure, actors could simply step from one location to the next on the as the turntable carried it to center stage. Each space would have to be relatively small, and that would help focus the audience on the tight two-person scenes. Small spaces would also lend a note of realism, we were, after all, talking about cramped tenements and tiny producers' offices. Once I had the idea, I realized I'd better find a way to show it to James the next day. So I stayed up all night, madly building a rough model out of mat sticks, balsa wood, old popsicle sticks, whatever else was handy to create the structure. Then I tore through my shoebox with leftover model pieces, doors, windows, and architectural details scavenged from other sets to flesh out the idea. By the wee hours of the morning, I had a model pulled together, quite rough, but conceptually clear. In fact, its very crudeness seemed to speak to the play, which is all about the boundless energy and messy exuberance of youth. Its messiness also seemed to reflect the visual disorder of New York City, a place that's constantly rebuilding and reinventing itself, continually piling new structures over and around old ones. The exuberance of the model was exciting. I need to translate that into the final set. I pulled out the second model and walked James through it. He thought for a moment and then said, yeah, that's it. The whole thing, from idea to approval, had unfolded in about 12 hours. I'd spend the next six months sorting out the details, and the six months after that, realizing them. And then I'm going to give you just a little bit of Scottsboro Boys, which we did with Susan Stroman, who was our other guest. 
There were changes as we previewed the show, but nothing major. One night, John Kander walked into the room musing about the song Financial Advice, which we all called Jew Money because of the repeated lyric. John, who's Jewish, said to the room, this song needs to be nastier, what rhymes with kike? Despite and because of its minimalism, the physical production was exhilarating. It opened on a bare stage with the chairs, as if declaring, we have nothing to hide. Those tra chairs transformed into every location in the show, the show required, because every design element worked seamlessly to tell the story. My favorite spatial transformation took us almost instantly from the row of boxcars on a sunny southern afternoon into a jet dank jail cell. I've already described Stroh's ability to enter entertainingly misdirect the audience as the scene is reshaped. The audience didn't see the actors resetting the chairs to form a cell until she wanted them to, and so it seemed like stage magic. The lights carved out a bright square into the darkness, containing and constraining the space. The sound of a steel door slamming as the final chair was set in place created an undeniable sonic reality. The prison guard jackets and hats slipped on by the end men helped describe the location. All of it was just enough to trigger the infinite, infinite imagination of the audience and make them see, hear, and feel the most cramped and awful prison cell ever. The energy in the tiny vineyard theater was electric. Audiences were blown away by the show. Word of mouth spread quickly, and we were soon sold out for the entire run. I had to miss the opening night performance because I was teching Sondheim on Sondheim, but I made it to the party. Everything was magical. Then the New York Times Review came out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, everybody's got a copy of the book. For those who haven't read it yet, uh, what's what's the format uh, of the book? Um, what it is is I um, there are six chapters that each describe the process of a show I designed. So it goes essentially from the moment I was called about the show initially uh, up through opening night, basically, um, and it goes through the design process and then how we actually realize the whole thing. And then each of those chapters is paired with an interview with the, usually the director of that show, with, with James Lapine and Susan Stroman and so on. Uh, talking not so much about my work with them, but about their work on some of the great shows in Broadway that they've done and, and their approach to design. And what it's really attempting to do is show not only how I work with a variety of directors, but how a variety of great directors all create shows, but in very different ways. And each of them has their sort of own approach and their own method of doing it. Um, I, I got my theater training at the University of Texas in Austin in the drama school there. I wish this was the kind of textbook that uh, that it, are you intending this uh, to be for school? Uh, I would obviously love it if schools wanted to pick it up and start using it, and, and I have sent it to every uh, every design teacher that I know. <laughs> and, uh, but we'll see. I, honestly, it, it sprang from, in some ways, from talking to students. I think the question I get asked the most is, what is my process? And I never had a good answer for it, and part of that is that I, I don't have one. I kind of figure it out on each show. There's a couple things that are the same on every show, but generally, it, because it springs so much from who the director is and what the show is, there's, I can't shoehorn it into any one way of doing it, and that was the, the genesis of this. Your first experience with theater as an audience member was, was what? Oh, man. I honestly couldn't tell you what the first, I should know this, but I honestly don't know what the first play I ever saw was. The, the first two shows I saw on Broadway were Phantom of the Opera and Into the Woods, um, and that was sort of poetic that I, that I ended up, was lucky enough to work with so many people made those shows. Um, but I, that's fine. I don't know if I've ever been asked what the first show I saw was. I really don't know. <laughs> it was probably some high school production of something or other. And your involvement in theater, where, what was that? Early uh, on? I mean, you know, I was a kid who liked to do the school play, and I was a kid who liked to draw. And I, um, uh, I uh, when I was a junior in high school, I was an intern at a little summer theater in South Central Pennsylvania. And that was the first time I met a set designer, and I realized that there was somebody who takes the visual storytelling and combines that with theater. I don't think I understood that it was a job before that, and I think I probably was, uh, was sold as soon as I realized it was something one could do to make a living. That was the first sort of click about set design? That was the first time I realized that that was a job. I think in school play, the director, I don't know who usually made the set, but there was not a set designer, certainly, and that summer I realized that it was something that people did. And by the next year, I convinced my English teacher in high school to let me design old sets for the school plays. <laughs> Why? Wow, you just kept going. How old were you then? Uh, I was I was probably sixteen or seventeen, uh, and and yeah, and I yes, I, I just I have not stopped since. I guess. You ask all the guests in your book about their first experience and understanding about the importance of set design, and 
I reflected to my own, because I grew up in this small West Texas town, Ed Grayson, who went on to ride, come, uh, come back, uh, back to the dunk side. Uh, come back to the, uh, yeah, the dunk, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean, uh, was, as a younger person, was directing the, the children, including me, in West Texas. And he was a real man of the theater. He was a person of the theater, where he would write, he would direct, he would, um, he would, he was a brilliant uh, set painter, and I thought that's what one did was to do everything. All of it, yeah. And I and I've sort of been disappointed in a lot of the training lately that it seems so siloed, and that you have sort of have to pick something. Do you see that as well? I think I think the industry turns you into that. I will say when I started, I did a lot of I did certainly more than I do now, and I and I feel like watching young people coming into the theater now, a lot of them are doing multiple. Until you find out the thing that you're good at, really. Um, I, I started out as a set and costume designer, even once I was out of graduate school and working professionally. And six or seven years into it, I realized that there were people who were better costume designers than me, and, um, and it would be better if I didn't try to do that and you know let, let somebody who was really good at it do it, but, um, and that I was a better set designer. So I think that kind of funneled me into it. But, but so I don't know. I feel like the industry kind of does that. But there's you know, great examples. Of you talk a lot about, about uh, the mentors, some you knew, some you just admired. Um, you know, some of the people we all studied, Robin Wagner, Eugene Lee, Boris Aronson, Tony Walton. What, what, did, what did, give us an idea of what you got from them and the influences you have from some of these other uh, yeah, designers. I, I think the, the one who grabbed me when I was in school was Joe Milziner and seeing his kind of brilliant paintings. Um, but when I, when I moved to New York and was you know, going to the half price booth and seeing what I could see, uh, Robin Wagner sets were really the ones that, that kind of wowed me. And it, is, and it, is, it goes back to kind of you know transforming space. He, the way he moves physical scenery through space was is brilliant, um, and I, I learned a lot just watching those. And I, um, when I was I don't know maybe five six years out of graduate school, I got a hold of a ground plan of the producers um, and just like poured over it to understand how he fit all that into the theater and how it worked. But literally just studying the plan of that show taught me so much about how you pack theater into the scenery, the scenery into a theater. Um, and uh, as fate would have it, I am doing a Susan Stroman show in the St. James uh, coming up, where we were packing an awful lot of scenery into that same theater. <laughs> we talked uh, upstairs a little bit about the Yiddish fiddler on the roof that you did, and um, I had indicated to you that I'd done an interview with Joel Gray during that production, and I remember saying to him, and I didn't even know you then, and uh, I remember saying, um, "Wow, oh, there's a you know spoiler alert. Um, there's a there's a chair and a table, and, a, and another chair on another table, and the fiddler comes on and gets on the chair, gets on the table, gets on the chair, he's on the roof, and it's like that's theater because it's just imaginative." Mm -hmm. And I said, "It's as if Anna Tefka was putting on this production." <laughs> and I said, was that the idea behind it? And he said, no, we just didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> that was definitely a case of a poor theater. We thought we were doing that production for four weeks uh, down on the Battery at the Little Theater. And, uh, and we designed it as appropriate for that. Um, and lo and behold, the production has been around ever since, and remounting it since winter. But, but there was something very appropriate to that, to telling that story with very few resources. And it comes back to, again, like the, the I talk about this a lot in the book, there's an Al Prince quote that I love, where he says, if you're doing a musical, you need to leave a lot of empty space. You need to leave a lot of room for the audience's imagination to fill in the blanks. Um, and that makes the audience complicit with the production. And it's it's a real uh, touchstone for me. Um, but that is that is the superpower of theater, is that it, it does invite the audience in to be part of it in a way that the film is a realistic medium, and you tend to sort of put it all out there in film. Uh, and in theater, it's, if you can suggest things, it's actually more powerful than if you show them what the real thing is. This um, less is more. Before we bring out our guests, I just want to talk briefly about this production that you and I got to do. And it was a real lesson for me, too, because um, I had recently directed uh, this oratorio, this musical version of the story of Matthew Shepard, the young man who was um, killed in, in Wyoming almost 25 years ago for being gay in Laramie. And um, it's a beautiful oratorio, incredible music, and uh, you agreed to do the set design. What drew you to that once we once we contacted? Um, I mean, it was both the story was fascinating, the music was beautiful. The thing that draws me to almost anything is is the 
was the script or the text or in this case the music, but also it was the space. We were doing it at St. Paul's Chapel downtown. It was a gorgeous space, and I thought, God, I've never gotten to design in a space quite like this before, and it seemed like a really like a fascinating, unique opportunity to tell this this incredibly powerful story in this really beautiful space. And in the less is more lesson, you know, it came back. I have a copy of the set design upstairs. I brought it here today. It was basically a single platform. I, 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 there's only two things I want to talk about with this. One is the idea of the rake, which was really interesting because it was a forced perspective drawing you had done, or so it seemed. And I said to you, how big is the rake? And, and I said, I didn't mean it to be raked. But, <laughs> um, but we ended up, to, we had a, a 40 foot long platform that because of the way I drew it, it looked like a, a, a hillside. And it, it, it was so funny because I thought it was your great idea, <laughs> and it turned out to be just my misconception, but we ended up doing it anyway. We ended up doing it, because we, and, it that, and that's the magic of collaboration, is that it's something that I didn't mean, and you wouldn't have thought of, but the two of us together, we got to that. And, and almost any great collaboration I've had, that's what happens. You get, I'm doing something with the director, and the two of us coming together are gonna do something that either of us would have done alone, and hopefully it's better than either of us would have done our own. And that, again, is the magic of this, this form, and I think it's what we mean and the only other tug of war we had was over the projections, which um, you had designed this surface that was four feet high and 24 feet across. And I'd already, I'd done it for Ravinia and I did it for PBS and I had the projections and they were set for 16 by nine, um, more of a standard movie thing. And you went, no, I think this is better. And Remember, I came back to you. I think about, about six times you came back and said, suggested, do we really need do to we do really this? Do this? <laughs> I'm here to tell you in public, you were totally right. <laughs> I rethought the whole thing and redid the whole thing, and it was incredible. And for the record, I do ultimately always do what my director says. But sometimes <laughs> I argue a lot before we get there. So if you put your foot down and said, no, I don't want to do this, no. I would have buckled it. Well, the conversation was, you said to me, do I feel comfortable doing this? And the answer I gave you was no. I don't feel comfortable doing this, but that's no reason for me not to do it. <laughs> so I thank you for that. Thank you. That was thank incredible. You. And also the lighting of it. How important in general is you do a set design and then, then the, you, you've got a lighting designer? The lighting designer is crucial to me. It's, I, you know, the director is my, is my key collaborator, but the lighting designer is, is next. Because, because that's a, a good lighting designer can make a bad set look good, and a bad lighting designer can make a good set look bad. And mm -hmm. it's, when I get somebody who I work well with, who is, is you know, where we're really kind of in sync with each other, it's, it's magic. We, we shot this on 10 cameras. It's online if you'd like to see it for free at trinitywallstreet.org. Uh, I do want to bring out our guests. They've been so patient. Uh, they frankly need no introduction. Please welcome James Lapine and Susan Strobe. <laughs> Using chairs and 
letting the actors make the set, if you will. But then it was uh, what was interesting, and one of those kind of collaborative mistakes or not mistakes was I do pre-production for like two weeks before I do a show, and we go into a space. And um, I had chairs, but we had um, silver chairs, and I was thinking they would be fender chairs. Uh, but um, for some reason, well, Beowulf built these chairs, and in fact, because they were silver, all of a sudden it gave the show more contemporary spin, and that was just he hadn't painted them yet. But in fact, it had kind of helped the whole concept of the show. So that's like a perfect example about that kind of collaboration where some something happens and you just go, oh, no, that's it. That's what we should be doing. Kind of like a happy accident moment. Happy accident. We, we had this idea that we were. We, we we're going to make these kind of tinker toy chairs that were we needed 12 chairs and we had to interlock in all these ways. Um, but it was kind of the prototype that we were playing with. And I, I think my intention had always been to make them black and try to make them look like antique chairs. And in the pre-production, they were working pretty well for what you needed them to do. But I thought, if I paint these black, they're just going to look like kind of a bad copy of an antique. They're not going to look like an antique chair. Um, and I. I, this was the first time we'd worked together. I'm working with the famous Susan Stroman. I'm terrified. Um, uh, and I, but I went over and I said, I think we shouldn't paint these because I, you know, I tried to explain. It. I said I think it's it's going to look like a, a mistake or like a bad copy of an antique chair. And you looked at me for a second like I was crazy, and you said, Say that again a different way. Um, and, and and so I don't even remember what I said the second time, but I, just, I tried to say the same thing again. And you're like, No, I get it. You're right. And, and it, it turned out to be one of those turning points because we had been trying to do something that looks more antique, just in general, and and in fact, making it through very much of the moment uh, was was hugely helpful, and it made it it made it feel sort of artier, and it kind of lifted us out of the minstrel world, and made it more commenting on the minstrel world. Yeah. And uh, James, uh, we heard uh, Beowulf read uh, about Act One. Uh, Going to give you equal time on the, the origin story of the. Of the set, what are your what are your memory of that? Oh, I have a terrible memory. <laughs> no, in general, no, I don't really remember. I just knew that uh, we had a lot of ground to cover in that show, and um, it was. I thought I don't remember it being very difficult to sell, but obviously it was. And I mean, the difficulty of it was once the concept was there, was working it out, and then of course. They will work it out with such specificity, and then we get into rehearsal, and we get into previews, and I start cutting scenes, and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, we have to turn that thing 180 degrees together because <laughs> <laughs> we did it so it went sequentially as it. Turned. So, uh, but what was fun about it was a complicated set, but it was also, hey, let's put on a show because you spent all your money on the turntable, and we had to. <laughs> Basically, get whatever furniture we could find, yeah, yeah. and uh, that was fun. Man. That was fun. The actors hated it. <laughs> they hated it. Yeah. Was that exhausting? I mean, it was big. It was huge, it was right? Huge. It was huge. They had to walk up a lot of steps, and it was totally disorienting. They made me get up on that set, and because you're turning around and you get up, and you don't know where the hell you are. You know, is the audience that way, that way? But you saw. It was the big, I mean, that was the big surprise to all of us, is that it, because it was 60 feet in diameter and three stories tall, so when you got inside it, it moved so smoothly, you literally didn't know you were moving. And people would think they were walking into the stage right wing and suddenly appeared downstage center staring at the audience. Um, and it, uh, and you know, we had, there were dressers hidden amongst them, there were carpenters hidden around, it was in this sort of massive moving world. And we, what we ultimately did, once we, once we discovered this was a problem, is we went out and bought a bunch of green and red rope light and put it in all the wings. And red was stage right, and green was stage left, and whatever. So <laughs> when you were standing there in the darkness, all you had to do was look for the rope light in the wings, and then you could orient. But it was, again, it's, it's the danger of trying something that is not the way you normally do it. Is you start, there were wonderful things that come out of that, but then you discover all the problems you're creating, too, um, that you didn't expect. Um, I mean, it's interesting, those two shows, one of which was so heavily built and, and complicated, and one that was so unbelievably simple and gorgeous, gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought that they're amazing in different ways, you know, it's, you have to talk to the designer, too. It's the joy of this job, is what makes it interesting, is 
is you know, getting to work with directors as different as the two of you and on shows as different as those two shows is that every, every project is sort of equally different and I always learn something that I didn't know about by doing it. I'm working on a show right now where I'm suddenly learning how a law library organizes their books, which isn't the Dewey Decimal System, it turns out. Um, and not something I ever really needed to know, but for this particular set, I do need to know it. Um, and so you go down these funny rabbit holes and, and learn fascinating things. I enjoyed a lot of uh, theater lessons uh, in the book, and you zero in, James, in your conversation with Beowulf about, about transitions and the importance of transitions. And it's, um, you know, I think it's something we all think about. You want to get from one seat to another. But talk a little more about that and why that, why that very small thing you think of seemingly is so important. Well, it's all about rhythm, you know, creating a rhythm of a production and a show. And uh, you are really have to think about that in advance in the design process because otherwise you'll get out there and all of a sudden uh, you have to think about it in terms of how you stage, how you get people where they go, the size of the theater, it's all integral in a way. So, uh, and we've all been there where we haven't thought of something, you know, that we discover. And sometimes that turns into something surprising and great, and sometimes it's like, well, we figure something out. <laughs> Generally you do, you have no choice, so. You mentioned it too, so Susan, in the book too, where it's like, okay, this scene change is gonna take an hour today, <laughs> but it's going to take 45 minutes tomorrow. You, you just sort of plan on that. Yeah, every, every good scene change is, is seven seconds. <laughs> is that it? Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Just to go. And, uh, and so I always say that to Wolf. <laughs> Come yeah. on, let's move it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, I know. but yeah, it's very important. And I think, too, more important today because an audience has a more cinematic eye. They want the story to keep going, whereas you know, in the old days, you'd do a blackout, and the audience would wait for the set to change, mm -hmm. and then the lights would come back up. But the audience still wants to stick with the story, so even in your transitions, you're still somehow telling the story, whether it's through dance or through the acting or the set. But the story keeps moving forward in the set transitions. Part of the challenge of that is that it means that well before the show is being staged, we have to figure that stuff out and sort of take our best guess at what's going to work you know, nine months from now when we're actually putting the show on its feet. Um, you know, we're working on a show right now that's the set is being built in the shop. Um, Stroh won't go into rehearsal until January on the show, but the set's going to all physically exist, and a lot of it will be in the theater by the time she starts rehearsal. So we're making choices now that are going to affect all of that down the road. And get it's not quite locked in stone, but it, it starts to get locked in stone right away. Um, but I, she gets like a daily email from me, like, does, is, does this door, the doorknob in this door is supposed to be on the stage right side and it opens up stage, right? I know, because I know. because I know. once I build it and it's wrong, it's going to cost $6,000 to fix it. <laughs> so I don't need to do it right the first time. When, when we did POTUS on Broadway, which was a comedy this summer, uh, which had a turntable, the way a door slams is because it was a farce. And the way the door slams on the button of a, uh, a line it's funnier if it slams one way or the other, depending on the line. So Beowulf, well, I went into a studio and Beowulf dragged in like four doors. And we, we ended up saying the joke and then slamming the door to see if it was funny or if the door went this way if I was on the other side. Before he could build a set, we had these freestanding doors to get the joke right. I love that. I love that. Stuff people never know. Yeah. And did you choose right? We did. I don't think we had to flip any doors in the Yeah, attack. we did, because that's funny. what he didn't want to do. Yeah. He wanted to get the door in there, and there was no changes, so he dragged these doors down to the studio. And uh, we were slamming and saying, saying a joke, and then slamming a door. <laughs> you talk early in the book about uh, hate the set day. Yes. Yeah, you talk about that. The first day of the act. That doesn't seem real. That, that is very real in my life. That is the first day the actors are on the set, everybody hates the set. They might think it's pretty, but they hate the fact that they can't go walking through this line because it, you know, suddenly there's a wall there, or there's a door they've actually got to open, and they're not just minding all of it. Um, and so it's, I don't, I, I'm being uh, melodramatic about it, but it does for one day, basically, I sort of just like put on my armor, and I think everybody's gonna complain about everything because something, this is wrong and that's wrong, and it's not, it's because they've been working in a studio for four weeks and they've gotten timing perfect, everything is perfect, and now it's bumping into the reality of how it has to play out. And, you know, everyone's professional, and in a day they will probably rework the timing and they'll figure it out and it'll all be fine. 
but for one day it's all going to be wrong. Um, and you know, can the step be a half inch shorter? Can the score open the other way? Or whatever. And sometimes you really do have to change those things on the physical set. But if we've planned it all out right, you're not you're not changing as much as everybody wants to change on the first day. Uh, for the Matthew Shepard thing, I mean, you know, it was just tape on a floor for the longest time. So when we brought the set in, the actors were really sort of moved by it. They were emotionally moved by that because it, it felt so real. D does the set design do that for your actors sometimes? You know, actors. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you that. You can't make a generalization, you know. First of all, every day is somebody's fault, you know. So when the, 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 they're on the set, it's going to be Beowulf's fault. Um, gee, I don't know. I tune out a lot. You know, if somebody has a physical issue getting, that's one thing, you know, the aesthetics is not their ball game as far as I'm concerned, you know, I think um, they have to live in the world that you make and sometimes an actor will have a really good remark about something that they're touching or whatever, but sometimes you have to say, well, you've only touched it once. Why don't you just use it for a few days and inevitably it goes away as a so, um, you know, when you, you into the rodeo, as Susan <laughs> and I have, you kind of get used to navigating you know, everyone's insecurities on the career. I, I think this is some unspoken rule of stage managers that I've worked with, because they, they'll, take down the, they'll take down the studio smaller than when I get there, so then I'm happy when I get to the set. <laughs> and, <it's laughs> big, and I think, I figure, well, how much more space than I had in the I didn't realize you knew we were doing that. Yeah, I think it's some thing that they, the sneaky thing they've been doing to me to keep me happy in tech. I'm going to get that stage made. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. What's your process for taking the set design and deciding the blocking? Is this something you do with software? Or do, you, do you like have the model and move the actors around? How do you decide the blocking around a bear or set? Well, we, we do, you know, we collaborate with a the model. They are just wonderful about building a model. And uh, that's very, very helpful about to help you visualize transitions and such. Um, and uh, you know, he, he does put little figures in there for us to, to look at. But in fact, you know, I don't really block anything until I have the actor in front of me, because you're inspired by actors. And you know, so that, that doesn't really happen uh, until you have the actor in front of you. But, but in fact, once he builds that model, you do visualize it, what it could possibly be. Same for you, James. You know, when I, st I started as a director, I blocked just the opposite, everything out on a grid. Every scene, every moment, she's gonna move here, then, on this line, that line, whatever. And just because it made me feel more secure going in the room, and also I'm not a choreographer, so, you know, how people move and whatnot, I wanted to kind of, it's from my background as a graphic designer, I did that. Now I'm much looser. You know, I guess I'm loose, you know. Uh, if you, but when we work together, I always want to know their options. If this doesn't work, then, you know, I could do that, or to just create a set that has some um, ability to breathe so you can change your mind, you can write a new scene, you know, that it's uh, a process. So, but every show's different, right? I mean, every show has its own rules, really. It's true of everything we do, though. I think a big part of it is, especially on new shows, what I think almost all of what the three of us have done together, you're figuring it out as you go. And so it, everything we do has to stay as flexible as it can so that the show does have prime time to grow and change and you can change things. Um, and the set is in some ways the least flexible thing because it's steel and wood and machines. Um, but even there you try to keep you try to keep some amount of flexibility or talk through and say these are the things that are locked in, but these are the places where we have some flexibility. Um, on POTUS that we did together. We got into, I think they were in previews, and we realized we wish the turntable could go faster. Yeah. And we got the shop to come in and, and essentially re-gear the motor so it could go faster. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was sort of fantastic. Uh, yeah. And it was just for a few transitions, but it, what it allowed us to do is through the course of the first act is it's a farce, and so it gets zanier and zanier as time goes on. And what we realized is by the last few transitions, you just want it to be moving at lightning speed uh -huh. because that's, that's the pace of the story. And so the, the physical objects need to need to move at that pace yeah, as well. Yeah, were cool with that. 
They loved it, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> they got to slam those doors on a uh, <laughs> while they were running. Sort of our, our game was to see if we could get the turntable running faster than they could run. Yeah. I don't think we ever actually got ahead of them. Yeah, I am. What's great about Beowulf's book, too, for young um, people who want to become directors and become, get, be creatives in the theater is because uh, I know if, uh, over the pandemic I ended up speaking to a lot of young people on Zoom, you know, from different colleges and universities, and it seemed like a revelation to them that there's such a collaboration with mm -hmm. the set designer and the costume designer and the lighting designer, how mm -hmm. how it is a real collaboration, and and the thing is you could you know you can make the most beautiful dance step in the world, but if it's not lit right and if it's not in the right costume, it doesn't matter. So you have to know a bit more about. Uh, all the other um, design elements and and be ready for that collaboration and and be ready for the give and take of a designer as of an artist to end up with what you for the ultimate uh, vision and I think uh, for a lot of folks coming up it's sort of this revelation that you oh you have to have to talk to the costume designer <laughs> <laughs> you have an interesting uh, statement in Bay West book too Susan uh, that comedy plays best against a real set yeah. Well, talk about that, expand on that. Well, like, uh, like the producers, which was done by Robin Wagner, which, um, um, you know, Beowulf's so wonderful about Paul and Robin all the time and stuff. Uh, all those comic scenes were done off of a real set, like there was a real office for Max Bialystok, and, you know, everything was real, and so the comedy just played well against it. So it just, rather than, um, you know, uh, doing it against a cartoon set, you know, the, it's like, you know, uh, canceling out the comedy mm. a little bit. We talked about it a bit with POTUS, because it, it, again, that, you know, that was a farce, and it was set in the White House, and we did, it was a sort of a theatrical version, but it, it with a lot of forced perspective, but it was basically realism. And I, one of the things Jerry Zach said to me, because we were talking about farce, is when you're doing a farce, you want the world you're in to be as possible, so there's a danger of breaking it, and it actually raises the stakes. If you're worried, and it, and it happens, you know, in the course of POTUS, they're ultimately they're like smearing blood on the walls of the White House. And when you get to that moment, the yeah. audience roared with laughter every night because you're you're desecrating this beautiful thing. Um, and that's that is part, whereas if it is an abstraction, that happens less. Um, and so I think that's part of it. The first show we did together was spelling because yes. that was not a realistic set. Extended real sense. Yes, I think that that's fair. And that's kind of why I like what you did and why you had other jobs with <laughs> Because it, it, it was a skew. Yes. It you was, knew exactly where you were, but you knew it was slightly off kilter, or maybe more than slightly yeah. off kilter. So, yeah. uh, and I felt when the audience walked in, they were already like, not going to be on regular gym. I mean, that, absolutely. And I think in the case of Spelling Bee, that was a case where from the get-go we had adults playing children. So yeah. we were not in a, in, in a real That's true. Absolutely. And, and yeah. you had audience members on stage also pretending to be children. Um, <laughs> so we prepared. Yeah. <laughs> I want to take it to one of your most recent collaborations, which is actually not in the book. Uh, Flying Over Sunset happened after you pretty much put the book to, to bed. I've had limited experience with hallucinogens. <laughs> and by that I mean earlier today. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I, I felt like there was a contact high from watching the show based on not only following the story, but the way the set morphed and changed. Am I alone on this? I, I, I really felt like there was... We're pumping stuff into the <laughs> It was something in the air. It's really extraordinary the way you brought that the drug experience in, in to both the set and the story. Huh. Well, they look, have you ever done a drug? I, I have done a drug, but I, I tried to jam. We started, I, I, I had never touched LSD. And uh, when we, can I tell them what you told us? I think most of the team really remember what I told them. James, James's response was, I, I did enough LSD for all of us. <laughs> but honestly, the way, I, the way I tackled it was just like anything else I do. Like, I've also never been in 19th century France. Um, you know, I, so when, I, when I'm when i doing something set in 19th century France, 
because I read a lot of books and I try to learn what I can learn about it. And I approach the LSD trip the same way. I, you talk to drug dealers? What did you do? I, I talk to people who've done, who've done hallucinogens. I mean, yeah. I talked to James a bunch, but I, I read a bunch about it. I, uh, one of my assistants loves her magic mushrooms. Um, and I just I talk to people, and you start to find what are the common things that everyone describes. And then you're not, you're not going to be giving the audience hallucinogens. So you're trying to find, similarly, you're trying to find a way to visually represent that experience. Um, and but we weren't, I don't think, we didn't ever talk that much about, we're trying to make the set trippy, we weren't trying to literally make it We have to start from somewhere real in order to abstract it through yeah. the experience, so it was kind of, uh, as my friend Heidi Edger, another designer, would say, we need some gags. Yes. You know? So we kind of approached things that could change that an audience wouldn't realize we could change. Or, right. And then we used projections. I was going to say, you didn't do the projection, no, did you? No. But you must have worked closely with the projection designer because there was a lot of... Sometimes to his chagrin. What do you mean by that? I, I, I'm very opinionated about projections because it is so interpretive. In, in that case, we conceived the whole set as this projected surface. And so I spent a lot of time sitting by the projection designer having opinions about things. No, no, you were, I mean, you have to be talking to each other, everybody. And yeah. It's hard because you're up against a new show audience coming, things not finished, things not working. It's, it's pretty cuckoo. Um, but you, he's pretty calm, at least as far as it's on concern. Mm -hmm. you know, you've probably both seen me lose it once or twice, but I <laughs> try not to. No, trust me. You, I, you seem to me pretty calm. I don't know, do I seem calm to you? Mostly <laughs> calm. I've known you a long time. I've only seen you get really mad once or twice. always calm? <clears throat> This one has the poker face to end all poker <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, I've now known you for, I think, 15 years, and we've been yeah. in, in the trenches on some really like, tricky projects together. And I've seen you like start to crack twice, and I've never seen you crack. <laughs> and I go, sorry, you're saying you're drunk. <laughs> yeah. I, I once saw Hal Prince almost push you over the edge. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Susan, you started off uh, as a dancer, and Former and obviously a choreographer as well as a director. Um, those early days, uh, how, how, how had that informed how you work with designers? Well, you know, as I, I think the set moves almost like choreography, like dance, like I see the set moving almost like a production number. So very much a part of, of how it moves and it is, is a dance to me. And uh, so uh, a lot of set designers don't understand that or can't quite, Robin Wagner certainly did, you know. Um, but uh, that it's very much a part of the journey of a show because a lot of the shows have a journey in movement of how, how it moves, how it starts, how it ends. And so I think of, of things musically that way. Part of my job, I think, when I'm doing a show with Stroh is that I'm, I am creating a dance partner for her in a way. I'm creating a, a physical thing that's going to be able to, to move in a choreographic way with what she's doing. Um, and depending on what the show is, those needs are different. But with something like POTUS, it was, it was mostly about you know, rhythm door slams and which way they slammed. Um, but on a lot of shows that we do, it's very much about what the surface of the floor is, which oh. is the bane of both of our existence. That's <laughs> take you down the floor. <laughs> so um, we went through it, with, didn't you, with Tony? Uh, the floor? Why not? No, we didn't because we actually we could afford the floor that we wanted. Oh. When you're when you're doing a tap show with a real like A plus tap dancer, there's very specific needs. Not the floor. Um, no, that's a lot of um, Yeah. But and, and and a lot of those needs do not play very nicely with. The big heavy automated scenery rolling around them. And that becomes the challenge for me is how do you make those conflicting needs? Um, for dancers, it's, yeah. you know, either it's the tap floor or it's a, a Marley from LA dancer. And then you have big units coming on, so, and the units have to be supported by the floor. So, yeah, I mean, half my life has been talking about a floor all the time. <laughs> One of the pieces of advice uh, you all give which I was really glad to see was something I've said when I talked to younger people, which is that it always seems to me, when I came to New York, there always seemed to be two ways to go, two distinct big categories, which was audition, which is like love me, take me, and just has its own, and you have to do it. And the other one is starting your own thing. Um, 
I, I walked into a bank at 19 and asked them to give me some money, not as a robber, but for a show. And, uh, and I wasn't actually asking them to lend it to me. I just wanted them to give it to me, and they did. And um, I got to direct my first show, and I was so delighted to see your story of Flora the Red Menace, and that you just had the guts to go, I want to do this. Yeah. And, uh, and, and create your own thing, to, uh, tell them. Well, you know, it's that, um, uh, the, I, I, was, I was in a show that lasted one week on Broadway. It was called Musical Chairs. And you probably missed it. <laughs> um, but and I was met with, a, with a, a young actor named Scott Ellis, and we were sitting out in front of the theater lamenting on how we wanted to be on the other side of the table. I really wanted to create, came to New York to create, but how do you do that? How do you break in? So he, Scott had done The Rink with Cantor and Ebb, and I had done the tour of Chicago with Cantor and Ebb. And so we, we knew them a little bit, but we thought, what if we knocked on the door of Cantor and Ebb and said, could we um, do one of your shows and take it off Broadway and do it in a new way? Uh, and so we bravely knocked on the door to Cantor and Ebb, because the worst thing that could happen is that they say no. And, uh, but we knocked on their door and asked them if we could take a show of theirs called Floor of the Red Menace and take it off Broadway and do it in the form of like WPA theater. And, uh, and they said yes, which we couldn't believe. So we, we uh, went down to the Vineyard Theater and, and mounted the Floor of the Red Menace. And it had this cult following and how Prince saw it and Eliza and all these people that loved it. And, and we became some good friends with Cantor Neb to then go on to create the, and the world goes round for them, and Stu Peer, and uh, Scott ended up doing curtains, I did Scott's four boys. So it was like this very much, uh, just from knocking on the door, taking that chance, uh, which I think for young people, they can't be afraid to ask that question. Because the worst thing that can happen is that someone just says no, and then you gotta go on. But, uh, but yeah, and I think we made, 200 bucks for the whole summer. <laughs> and, uh, but Scott Ellis and I never went on stage again. So. And you give the same advice by saying, you can't say no to yourself. Yeah, everyone else will say no to you, so don't say no to yourself. Go and, and, and try not to get your feelings hurt when someone says no, because it will happen a lot. But, but don't be the one saying no. Uh, there are other directors in, in the book. Maybe we should just talk <coughs> just a little bit about um, Jerry Zacks and your work with him. Well, tell us about that. Um, I mean, Jerry is, uh, is Mr. Broadway showman, and I, I, you know, if I'm doing a Jerry show, I, I know that basically he's going to want to be able to park people downstage center, and the whole set has to operate around allowing that. But in in a way that's similar to the way Stro does things, it is he he sort of chisels th chisels things down to like a nanosecond of time, um, and it's uh, you know watching him kind of perfect a little bit of comic business is fascinating to me. And also watching, you know, how easily that can be broken. I did uh, Bronx Tale with Jerry, and he co-directed it with Bob De Niro, who directed the film. And we did the show out of town in Paper Mill, and Jerry with Bob, I think, showed up for first rehearsal and for opening night, and that was it. Um, and he had, you know, opinions about the script, but he wasn't really involved in shaping it. And then when the show moved to Broadway, Bob was there and sitting in the theater with us. And the first day of tech, Bob suddenly started redirecting a scene that Jerry had directed, but he was directing it like a film director. He was doing a sort of intricate little moment of some, some bit of business that, you know, the front row would see, but nobody else would see. And what was worse than that, and what I think he just didn't realize at that point, was that he was breaking the rhythm of the show, that Jerry had gotten this kind of very tight musical comedy rhythm to the show, and suddenly Bob was taking a bit that had been a three-second bit, stretching it into a, a seven-second bit or something. But that starts to break the rhythm. Um, and I could see Jerry steaming, and I leaned over to my assistant, and I said, we could be watching this whole show get out of the toilet right this minute, because this is the kind of thing that will break it. Um, and I don't, there, I, it was never quite a calm relationship between the two of them, but to his credit, I think Bob realized, wait a minute, I'm messing something up, and Jerry's the one who really knows how to do this. And he did step back, and he let Jerry kind of be in charge of it, and he would weigh in on things and have opinions. But, um, but he didn't, he, he stepped back and realized that he shouldn't be tinkering with the rhythm of the show. Because that, that is sort of the magic of, of musicals that I think people who don't do them don't understand the intricacy of it. But, but that's one of Jerry's superpowers. 
And uh, we actually met uh, while I was executive producing a project at the public, and uh, right after, I think right before much, after much ado. Yeah. And um, Kenny, that was Kenny Leon directing. You talked to him in the book as well. Yeah. I, and Kenny's a very different sort of director. He's he's much more kind of a political director. Um, and but I I think his his interest is is with each story is is trying to sort of drive home of a kind of social political. And he's interested in storytelling too, but I think it, the driver for him is is sort of the socio-political point usually. Um, and what what I would say is Kenny's superpower is he he seems to have found a way to kind of talk about race in America on stage in a way that white people can hear what he's saying, and from what I can tell, black people can hear what he's saying, and he makes the points to everybody, and nobody gets so pissed off that they just shut down. I know he does that very consciously. I, when I did Much Ado About Nothing with him, this was well before the pandemic, before George Floyd's murder, and part of our production was essentially a Black Lives Matter rally, but it was it was long enough ago that Kenny didn't dare call it a Black Lives Matter rally, even in New York, because he thought it would make people shut down and not pay attention, so we kind of danced around it. But I, I watched him kind of thread the needle as we did that, saying, how far can I push this to make the point? to get the point so that people understand that the story we're telling is about people trying to defend their lives, um, but but do it in a way that we're not making a bunch of affluent Upper West Siders shut down and not, not pay attention to it. And I, it is a case, I, I, I don't read reviews that seriously because I don't, I'm not sure I care what they say other than they might make my show shut down, but, um, but it was a case where almost every one of the reviews seemed to spot on get what he was trying to say. And that fascinated me. Um, and I, I honestly almost wondered if he'd gone and like talked to all the reviewers or something. <laughs> but it was it was a case of, of watching somebody kind of do that and, and deal with this sort of sensitive, sensitive stuff um, and and communicate it. What was the banner on the? Uh... It was a Stacey Abrams banner. We were, and honestly, that was not even trying to be political. He wanted it to be Georgia in 2020. We were doing this in 2019. It was supposed to be Georgia in 2020. And he thought the fairest way to do that was to put a big Stacey Abrams banner on it. And Oscar Eustace actually didn't want us to do it, but it was too on the nose. Um, and we pushed it through and did it. And what was sort of shocking is that the pandemic rolled along and, and suddenly the Black Lives Matter spread across the country. And Stacey Abrams didn't actually run for anything in 2020, but in fact was the kind of the linchpin of the whole election at the end. Um, was, I, I, I was talking to a group after that with Kenny. And I said, if this guy tells you what the future is, you should listen, because he nailed on that one. He, a year ahead of time, he kind of laid out everything that happened in the summer of 2020. Um, he laid it out 18 months earlier. And a lot of that is, I think, you know, being a black man in Georgia, he was aware of currents that I wasn't aware of. Um, but uh, I have to tell you, Stacey Abrams was sitting in front of me the night I went to see oh, wow. the show. And I thought, do they do a different poster? <laughs> Depending on who shows up, yeah. I wasn't sure because she was standing up taking pictures. With yeah, yeah, no, no, she came up because we did that. She and Kenny are friends. Right, right. right. It took me by surprise. Um, you also have interviews. They're no longer with us, but you have interviews in the book with uh, with Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim. He, um, you, he tells in your book one of the stories I'd heard before, which I thought was so telling, and I've loved this ever since I heard this. Was about uh, the difference between the London production. Uh, Phantom of the Opera, and that they were hand cranked. The, the automation. Yeah, will you talk about that? Because I think that's such a great story. Yeah, and as with anything with Hal, I always am not entirely convinced the story was true. But, but, it, but it made a good point. Um, Let's go with the point. Hal, Hal definitely did not let the truth stand in the way of a good story. Um, mm -hmm. But it's what made him such a great showman. Um, but apparently, it, it's probably just true. The, the, the famous candles that come out of, out of the basement of Phantom of the Opera. Um, at Her Majesty's Theatre in London, it was old Victorian machinery, and it was a hand crank that brought them up, and so they were going to record, 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 record. Um, and when they came to New York, they automated it all, and it was smooth and slick, and it wasn't as good. Um, and I think we run into that all the time, is how do you take machinery and actually make it feel like the human touch is part of it? Um, and, and I think what they did in that case is they went in and, and cued in a bunch of little errors or a little herky jerkiness mm -hmm. to the automation to make it feel more kind of hand cranked and, and natural. Uh, but it, it's it's a it's a crucial thing for all of us doing this, especially as as our world, my world gets so machine driven, is is allowing 
Maestro you said this when we started doing Prince of Broadway, it's it's a handmade medium. Theater is a handmade thing. And you want you want the product to feel you want to feel the humanity in it. It's not sort of handmade as you want to feel the humanity in it. Um, and it's important not to let the machinery and the slickness of technology get in the way of that. And and Sondheim, uh, you, you interview him for the book. Um, it's not been gone that long. What, what, what are one or two things that you remember that you've learned from him that affects your work as a, as a designer? I mean, it's funny when I when I interviewed James for the book. You asked me if I was talking to other writers, um, and at that point I had the plan to. But both this is a roundabout way of answering it. I asked every director I talked to what was the show that kind of really made you understand physical production and design as part of theater. And both James and Strauss said Sweeney Todd to me. Um, and Al, of course, had directed it. So I thought, well, I should go talk to Steve about this. And I, I didn't know him that well, but he was always very kind to me. Um, and he gave me an hour and we chatted. But the one of his touchstone things that I do lean on a lot is he, in an interview, I think, in the 80s maybe, he said, um, Lyric writing has to be concise because if you get too dense with it, the audience can't take it in. It's coming at you in the course of time. It's not poetry. It's something that you're hearing over however many seconds at the same time as people are dancing, wearing a flashy costume, and lights are moving, and scenery's moving. All these things are happening all at once. And if you let the lyric get too dense, the audience won't be able to follow it. Um, and you know, there are certainly examples that would belie that. Hamilton is yeah, showing a very of him too. Yes, um, yes. Who <laughs> does Let's face it, yeah, yeah. really complicated lyrics. Yes, yeah. yeah. You believe that. I, I, believe, <laughs> <laughs> I believe it as, as, a, as, a, as a theory. I would see you know, the Sondheim show and then go home, and of course in those days it was like the full album, and you know, you'd know read the lyrics. And I did the same thing with the Hamilton and when it came on television, I said, but on the Sondheim so, so that you can follow along because it's dense. Uh, we got some time for some uh, questions from you folks here. If there's something on your mind, we'd love to. Yeah. Thank you. 